Many applications in hydrogeology will be interested in removing water from storage in an aquifer. And so in order to understand how this works, we have to first look at the mechanisms by which we could remove water from storage. So first of all, we'll take a look at an unconfined aquifer. Here's the unconfined aquifer and here's the water table. When we pump water out from the aquifer, we drop the water table. Water table drops from there to there. As a result of that, the water that was in the pores in this region drains out of the pores. At least some of it drains out. Some of it will be retained, but some of it drains out. And that's essentially the water then that we're able to remove from the well. The process of draining the pores allows us to remove it from storage. But in a confined aquifer, shown here, where we have a layer that we're assuming to be of low permeability, in that situation, when we pump water out of the well, what we're assuming is that there's really essentially no change in the water table. And instead, the pressure changes here in the aquifer, in the confined aquifer, and that pressure change is what causes the ability to remove water. So as we drop the pressure, the water will expand and the aquifer material will contract. And as a result, when we drop the pressure, the aquifer will store less water than it used to. And that's the water that we've pumped out. So here's a, just a graphical illustration of how the process works. This is a tube that's filled with sand and filled with water and we essentially allow the tube to drain. So the water table, the surface where the pore pressure is equal to zero, it drops. The pores drain and we get some water here that has accumulated. So that's water that's released from storage in that sand by gravity drainage. Now the analogy for a confined system would be a tube that's pressurized and filled with sand and water. And so it's pressurized with this much hydraulic head right here. So we can imagine that when it's under this pressure, this tube is expanded somewhat as a result of the pressure. And when we drop the pressure, we drop the head, we don't allow the pores to drain. But when we drop the head, the vessel contracts. And when you drop the pressure, the water is going to expand. So as a result, this vessel will hold less water than it did when the pressure was high. And that water uh, comes out and is accumulated right here. That's the water that's released from storage due to a compressibility uh, effect of the water and the aquifer. So to see that second effect, the compressibility effect, well, take a look at this simulation. These are representing the grains of sand and they're in contact. And what we're going to do is take a look at what happened to these grains when we apply a stress to them from, uh, from above like that. So they compress and the grains here are deforming. They're becoming elongate somewhat. And as a result of the deformation, the space here in the pores, the, the pore volume is changing, being reduced. The overall volume is being reduced and the pore space is collapsing down. And so that would tend to expel water that was there originally. Okay, so there are a couple more steps and you can see it compressing down even more. Okay, so what we'll do now is include water in the pore space. And when we do that, we have to recognize that the water is under pressure and that pressure is pushing against the solid material. So right up here at the top, the water is uh, pushing up against, we can just imagine here this, uh, this imaginary surface. And above this surface is the weight of the entire overburden. So this is just a small piece of the subsurface and there's uh, other material on top of it. And so the weight of the overburden is applied here. And the pore pressure is partially supporting the weight of the overburden. And so when we drop the pressure, that's going to transfer the load that the pore pressure was taking. It's going to transfer it onto the solids. And so we compress the solids and that causes the solids to deform, just like we saw in the previous slide. And so when the solids deform, the pore space gets smaller 
and we release some water from storage. So when we drop the pressure, we're having water come out of storage. Essentially, that's what we'll do with a well. We pump water out of a well, we drop the pressure, and that results in a reduction of the volume of the water in the, in the aquifer itself. Stortivity will be an important concept for describing this overall process. And the definition of stortivity is here. So it's the volume of water that is released from storage, so the volume of water that's going to come out of the aquifer per unit area of the aquifer per unit drop in head. So that definition is shown here. This is stortivity. Uh, we use capital S to mean stortivity. And this is the volume of water that's released from storage. It's a change in volume. And the R means that it's released from storage. And it's per unit area of the aquifer per change in head in the aquifer. And it'll, it's important to see here that this is per change in head per decrease in head. Okay, it's not, it's not just any old change, it's a decrease. And that's in order to, that's because the volume is released from storage when the head decreases. And so that'll make this overall quantity positive. Okay, so let's see how this works. That's the change in the volume or the volume release from storage that we saw from the previous example. And this is the change in head right here when it drops from there to there. And the cross-sectional area is that green patch. Okay, so that's how the example that we saw previously that was animated translates into stortivity. And one thing that's important to recognize here is that generally the way this is going to work is this is taken as the aquifer thickness. So we're getting the volume that's released from storage over the whole thickness of the aquifer per area of the aquifer. So there are going to be two different kinds of stortivity um, depending upon whether the mechanism of release from storage is from pore drainage or from elastic decompression. If it's an unconfined aquifer, then we can think of the volume released from storage per area per change in head as a scenario that looks like this. Here's the aquifer and if the water level is there, the water table, and we drop the water table to there, then uh, as we drop the water table we'll release water from storage so we're dropping the water table, that's the change in head there. And the cross-sectional area is up here, the, the surface area looking down on this region. And this delta V is the volume that drains by gravity. The water table drops and this region will drain by gravity. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Uh, if we recognize though that this this shaded area, that's the re region that has been drained by this drop in head. So we could also think about this as the volume that has drained by gravity per total volume of aquifer that has drained. And if that's the case, then we recognize that stortivity in an unconfined aquifer is akin and in fact equal to the specific yield of the aquifer. In a, in a confined aquifer though, it's a bit different. The mechanism here is this elastic decompression, so the stortivity is going to be related to these terms here, beta and alpha. Alpha is the compressibility of the aquifer, and beta is the compressibility of water. N is porosity. B is the thickness of the aquifer, and gamma is the unit weight of the aquifer. So the important things here are these compressibilities. And we see over here that the aquifer compressibility is, uh, has units of one over pressure. So the way to think about a compressibility is like this. It's the volume change of the water per total volume per change in pressure. Okay, 
So the way to think about that is volume change per total volume per change in pressure. So if I were to drop the pressure by one PSI, then I would get this much volume change per total volume. So this thing here, this ratio, is like the fractional change in volume that you get as a result of changing the pressure by this amount. Okay, so I think that's fairly straightforward conceptually. You have a compressibility of water, you also have a compressibility of the aquifer. Now, this is how you typically see it. Um, the, see the storativity of a confined aquifer written. I should also point out though that there's another way that you see aquifer compressibility written. And I write it over there as alpha prime, and that's just gonna be alpha, oh, should be alpha over gamma. Okay, and so the way to think about this is that the regular compressibility is the fractional volume change per change in pressure. But if we write it like this, it's the fractional volume change per change in pressure head. So we could say that there's a certain fractional volume change that you get if the pressure head changes by one meter, for example. That would be uh, this form. And the, the, um, the aquifer compressibility would be the pressure change, the vo fractional volume change that we get per change in Pascal or PSI. Okay, so we'll see that come up in a second. All right, so here's a specific storage. Um, by definition, specific storage is the volume released from storage per unit volume per drop in head. And by comparison, storativity is the volume of release from storage. So it's essentially starting out the same as specific storage, but it's per uh, unit area of the aquifer per head drop. Okay, so here's specific storage, the volume change of water per total volume per change in head. So there's the fractional volume change, and it's now um, per, per change in head. So this has units of one over length, and specific storage will be equal to the storativity divided by the aquifer thickness. So we can rewrite this a little bit differently like so. Storativity is the thickness of the aquifer times specific storage. Okay, so those are terms, the specific storage and the storativity, those are two terms that we'll use to describe uh, release from storage and the characteristics that govern it in an aquifer. So here are some typical values of specific storage. And let's take a look. Well, the units are in one over feet. So this is the kind of unit that I was telling you about. This is like a fractional volume change per, um, per change in head. Um, you can tell that by the units. And the values that you get, let's say a typical sand aquifer, the specific storage would be around 10 to the minus five per foot. Okay, so it's one part in 10 to the fifth uh, change in volume per change in foot of head. That's the way to interpret it. Okay, so 10 to the minus fifth per foot. And uh, if you go to fractured rock, it's about 10 times smaller an intact rock is a bit smaller than that. And if you go in this direction, clay is about 10 times bigger than sand and gravel. And actually, some, so this means that it's, that it's softer. Um, and in fact, clays could be a, a good bit, uh, could be even, even bigger than this, perhaps even 10 to the minus three. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind though is that these values are just approximate. So I have over here, the range is plus or minus 10 times. So there's a, there's a good bit of, of variability. Just for reference, 
This is the compressibility of water. So you can see that sand and gravel, the compressibility of uh, sand and gravel, the uh, specific storage is about 10 times greater than the compressibility of water. And the reason for that is that um, the, the aquifer skeleton is more compressible than water is. Okay, so we've seen hydraulic conductivity, permeability, and now specific storage and storativity. So let's just take kind of an overview look at what these terms mean. The permeability, this is a property of the porous material. It's used to describe the resistance to flow, and it really just depends on the material, the porous material itself. Now, the hydraulic conductivity, it depends on the porous material as well as the fluid flowing through it. So that's an important distinction between permeability and hydraulic conductivity. But one thing that we need to keep in mind is both of these things here are properties of materials. So these are material properties. Um, and transmissivity, that's going to be the product of the hydraulic conductivity and the layer thickness. So the transmissivity is really a property of this layer. It's a property of a layer that consists of material of a particular hydraulic conductivity. So these two things are layer properties or material properties. This one is a layer property. And when we look at the storage properties, we have a similar thing. The specific storage, this is a property of the porous material and the fluid. And the storativity, that's the product of the specific storage and the thickness. So that's a property of the aquifer layer. So we have these two terms, this, the storativity and the transmissivity, that really wrap the material properties up with the layer thickness of the aquifer. So those things are related to a specific layer that's functioning as an aquifer. And we'll just keep that in mind as we go and determine what these properties are. That'll be the next step.